lot of folks in this room have provided samples um, that we analyzed and that forms the basis of a lot of the results that I'm going to be showing you today. So I've been really jonesing to come and give you guys an update about what's going on with this research program, and I think we finally hit critical mass of data for, for it to be worthwhile. So. And uh, most of what's on this slide is stuff that's already been talked about by Kim. I think the one thing that I'm going to emphasize here is that um, there's, you know, there's a massive variety of cyanobacteria out there. She already talked about that. Um, but I wanted to emphasize that there are sort of oops, water column inhabiting forms of cyanobacteria that produce toxins. And this is something that has been very heavily studied. Lakes and reservoir cyanobacteria blooms that produce toxic events. But cyanobacteria also occur in streams, and they also grow on stream bottoms. So there are benthic forms of cyanobacteria. And that is going to be the focus of my talk. So here's an example. And again, Kim pretty much touched on all these things. But the reason why we're interested in cyanotoxins is they cause illness in humans. They can cause illness and mortality in, in animals, um, people's pets, cattle, Wildlife, I'm going to give you an example in the next slide of a catastrophic wildlife mortality event that's been precipitated by cyanobacteria. And in general, there's a lot of, there's, like she said, there's so much research, uh, research that's being devoted to cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins, and every day we seem to learn about new toxin producers and things that are going on um, in this realm. Um, a number of research groups have recently documented that at least in the Lentic, um, side of things, so lakes and reservoirs, uh, water column blooms, and water surface cyanobacteria. Um, there's basically been a global expansion of sort of the geographic area where these toxigenic blooms are occurring, as well as the frequency with which they incur, and the blooms just in general lasting longer. And so this has been attributed to a number of anthropogenic phenomena global warming, nutrient enrichment, as well as the way that um, these water bodies are managed. Give, they give cyanobacteria kind of the upper leg. Um, so Kim ended with this slide, and I have a similar slide. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, a story that's very close to home and a poignant story because it's about a cute, cuddly creature named Southern Sea Otter in Monterey Bay. And about seven years ago, uh, biologists with uh, Cal Fish and Wildlife noticed that a lot of otters were dying and um, necropsies revealed that they were dying of liver failure, and tissue toxicity analyses revealed that they were uh, poisoned with microcystins. And it was not necessarily expected that there would be microcystins in high abundance within the marine environment itself. And so there was an investigation um, in, into potential inland sources of microcystins, and indeed, um, it was found that tributaries into the bay were carrying microcystins. One of the most studied ones was the Pajaro River, which drains Pinto Lake. This is a lake that frequently undergoes um, eutrophication, uh, uh, blooms of cyanobacteria that create a lot of toxin, microcystin. And the microcystin, as we have heard, is persistent in the environment. It actually has a half-life of around the order of 10 weeks under normal ambient conditions. And so the microcystin was making its way into the bay. It was getting concentrated in shellfish beds. And it wasn't just coming out of Pajaro River, it was actually coming out of a number of the trip, different trips to the bay, getting concentrated in shellfish beds, upon which these sea otters were feeding, and the sea otters ended up dying. So the point that I want to make here is that you know, there are potentially geographically far-reaching effects of cyanotoxin um, production, and uh, you can actually potentially get loading of cyanotoxins into receiving waters and then have sort of catastrophic effects like this story. So that's a point that I'm going to touch upon a little bit later when I talk about some of our research questions. But uh, as many of you are aware, because you're, a lot of you are intimately involved in the bioassessment that goes on in weightable streams throughout the state. So we've been collecting bugs forever and in the last few years, last several years now, We've also been looking at uh, benthic stream algae in order to look at stream condition based on uh, community composition. So in California, as many of you know, we don't only look at diatoms, we also look at soft-bodied algae, and that's a loosely defined term because we include cyanobacteria in our soft algal community. The result of that is that we now have this massive data set where we have um, 
recorded uh, species occurrences throughout the state, and actually we're up to over 1,200 samples. And so this has given us an opportunity to sort of start understanding the prevalence of benthic cyanobacteria in our weighable streams. Um, just doing a quick cross-check with literature, and this literature review that I did is now a little bit outdated, but basically just doing a comparison with our species list from the biomonitoring programs and the literature, there are 15 genera that have been documented to contain species that are known to produce um, cyanotoxins that we are finding in our streams. And of those 15 genera, five species have been identified in our streams. And if you take them all together, at least 13 different types of toxins are produced by them. And you can just see which ones produce which toxins with the X. Um, microcystins is produced by, by far the, the majority of the genera. And so we, we kind of had this idea that, wow, you know, the, the raw material is there. We actually have these, these species in our streams. They're theoretically capable of producing toxins. Are they, you know? And how widespread are these species? Are they just occurring here and there? or a little more ubiquitous? And the answer is a little more ubiquitous. So basically, if you compile and map all these data of species occurrences, here I have this color-coded red is um, taxa where the species itself has been identified as a toxin producer. And here we're talking about any cyanobacterial toxin, not just microcystis, although the map looks very similar if you're only focusing on microcystis. Um, the orange are where, at least at the genus level, a species we found in that, gene, um, in that some species in the genus we found, not necessarily that species itself, has been documented to produce a toxin. And then none is basically sites where we did not get any such taxa. So, and most of these are just one-time sampling, but despite that relatively um, limited effort per site, we found that 60% of our sites support what I'm calling toxic genera. And then of those, 10% are supporting toxic species. There doesn't seem to be any sort of real clustering. Just about anywhere you look, we're coming up with these benthic cyanobacteria that are capable, potentially, of toxin produce, production. So the next question is, we know they're out there. Are they actually producing toxins in the field? And if they are, should we even care? Because again, cyanotoxins are natural. They're naturally produced. So um, maybe it's something that's been going on forever, and maybe we don't really need to worry about it that much. But there are a few reasons that are kind of stealing off of ideas of the lentic um, cyanobacterial toxin literature that make me wonder, well, humans have really modified the environment, and there's a potential that we've modified it in a way that exacerbates the, the issue of toxin production. Um, with channelization of, of urban streams, we lose riparian habitat, which we, means we lose shading. Cranking up temperatures, cranking up solar radiation could potentially select um, for toxin producers. Hydro modification, stagnation changing flow regimes, that could potentially select for, for toxin producers. And in addition, just the fact that in certain parts of the state, you know, you, you would generally find a lot of intermittent or ephemeral streams that we've now perennialized through uh, nuisance flows. And so we're basically extending the temporal window during which toxin production can occur. So the answer to the $50,000 question is yes, they are producing toxins. Um, this is the result, a summary of the percent of detects for cyanotoxins that we've seen um, for, the, for several different classes of cyanotoxins. Overall, we have data over the past three years. We've been able to collect 368 sites worth of data. By far, most of our analyses have been focused on microcystins, and about a third of our sites have, um, we, we have detected microcystins. Again, this is largely one-time sampling per site. So it, it's definitely an underestimate of what's going on because it, it's such a limited sampling window that we're looking at here. Um, we also looked at several other cyanotoxins. The only other one where there was a pretty high frequency of, of detects was for lambiotoxin. Um, we also did get some hits for saxitoxin. We really analyzed that one to death, and we didn't get much, but there was something going on. And then um, some of the other ones we looked at, we had a very low sampling effort, so the zeros are kind of hard to interpret. Doesn't mean nothing's going on. We didn't detect anything. So the next question is, 
uh, how ubiquitous is the toxin production, and are we seeing any hot spots? And I would say that there's a little bit more of a clustering of activity here uh, in terms of who's actually chunking out the toxin. Uh, there are certain parts of the state, it's, let me first tell you that these um, zero looking things are where we did not detect microcystins. This is just focusing on microcystins. And um, basically these are non-detects, okay, but I put zero here for shorthand. But if you look at these icons, they grow in size and get warmer shades of color. That means higher concentration per area of stream, area of stream bottom sample that we got. And so there are parts of the state where there was sampling occurred where for whatever reason, and there are a lot of potential reasons for this, we just were not getting hits. And then other places, I mean, SoCal, there's a lot going on, but that's because in our data set, we have by far the highest density of sampling in SoCal. And in fact, it's blown up here. We're seeing pretty much a scattering of production of, of microcystins. And I just want to call out also that we have land cover data here. Uh, the green is sort of open space, minimally disturbed, relatively minimally disturbed land. The gray is developed. And basically, Nothing's really jumping out at you as, oh, there's, there's a much higher occurrence of production of toxins on one land cover type versus the other. However, there is quite a, a dramatic um, seeming uh, spatial effect on the actual concentration of cyanotoxins produced. So where we're starting to, where we're seeing some of these um, higher concentrations are in the higher elevation, less developed places. And that's echoed if we zone, zone in here. Um, in sort of the Tahoe Basin area and stuff, we're actually seeing some really high concentrations. At first, when I saw that result, I'm like, what the heck? You know, I really, that was not necessarily what I was expecting. I've actually thought about it some more recently and realized, first of all, it probably has to do with what kind of taxa you find in those places. So for instance, we find a lot of nostoc in some of the less developed places, and I think that the Nostoc is, is probably producing a lot, and I think that the person who follows me is gonna talk about that a little, maybe. Um, but also, I think there might be a little bit of an artifact of the way we quantify um, the toxin. So we basically do it per, per area of stream bottom, not per biomass of the organism. And because of the weird growth form of Nostoc, I think that might be in a way, sort of artificially increasing how much toxin it looks like is being produced. So I'm no longer quite as um, freaking out over what is this bizarre result that I can't really explain right now. <laughs> okay, one last thing I wanted to touch on. How am I doing on time, Jim? A few more minutes. Okay. So one of the other things that interested us and kind of got us kicked off on thinking about this, this project in the first place was <coughs> The fact that once in a while, you know, if you're collecting water column samples for toxicity bioassays, you might get toxicity in a, in a place, in a catchment where you don't really have much develop going on, development going on. And it's really hard to understand where that toxicity might be coming from. And it seems like it's worthy to consider the possibility that naturally produced toxins, cyanotoxins, could have a role in that. And so since we have some limited data available to us, we wanted to take a look at whether or not there was an association between bioassay results and whether or not we got tox uh, found toxin. And we focused on microcystins and saxitoxin. Um, and basically, we did find that there was a significant positive relationship. We were more likely to find uh, presence of these two cyanotoxin types in samples where there was also um, positive toxic uh, toxicity bioassay results. So it, it does <coughs> lend us to thinking that maybe there is a relationship. It certainly does not prove a relationship, but I think at minimum it leaves open the question. And it's something that you would want to know. If you're very concerned about toxicity, you'd probably like to know whether it's anthropogenic in nature or whether it's just a, a, almost an interference, if you will, from naturally occurring compounds. So. I'm going to end with sort of like some hypotheses that we would be interested in looking, looking into and going into the future. And the first one is what I just talked about, basically trying to get a little bit of more of a direct um, understanding of whether there is a mechanistic relationship between the presence of cyanotoxins and the outcome of bioassays. And another thing that I think that we, we should really be, within our biomonitoring group, I think we should be really interested in is the potential for effect of these cyanotoxins on stream benthos 
and not the least of which is could they potentially be influencing the biotic index scores. So not a lot of research has been done on um, stream benthic cyanobacteria toxin production, but one of the groups that has been looking at that uh, in Spain has actually uh, found some relationships between IBI scores and presence of cyanobacteria, and they have actually gone so far as to propose that indices be interpreted in light of the presence of cyanobacteria in monitoring sites. Um, another thing that I think that I would like to continue pursuing in the future is trying to get a grasp of the potential significance of, of loading um, of cyanotoxins into receiving waters by weightable streams. And so we now know that they're producing cyanotoxins, but we don't really have a good feel for what it means, you know, what the amount of cyanotoxins that they're producing really means and whether they represent significant loading sources to receiving waters. Certainly if they are significant sources, that would be of interest to us from many standpoints um, in terms of drinking water, um, recreational beneficial uses, and aquatic life beneficial uses like we saw with the sea otter story. And then finally, I think it's important to get a better grasp, uh, a lot of work has been done on this in lentic water bodies, not so much in streams, is to what extent might anthropogenic factors potentially be exacerbating the situation by somehow enhancing the production of cyanotoxins? Are they having an effect? If so, I think, again, that would be something that would be very important to understand better. So a lot of folks, like I mentioned, have contributed to this project. Uh, people offering to collect samples for us over the past several years. Again, none of this would have been possible without you guys uh, contributing in that way. So I want to really thank you for that and acknowledge uh, our data funding sources and um, folks that run, ran the analyses for us. And then do I have an, one minute? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, total off topic. Well, sort of related, but vaguely. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know that we now have an online tool for you guys to calculate your algae IBIs. So those of you who are collecting stream algae data and you need to calculate IBIs, and if you don't have your data in Swamp, which already has the reporting module that allows you to do that, Squirp now has an online tool for you non -swamp, your non-Swamp projects so that you can do that. And um, it is not yet publicly visible because it's still going through its final stages of review, but I can send you a link and get you hooked up with that if you need it. Any questions for Betty Fetcher? <coughs> hey Betty, I, I often wonder, is there a way to turn your toxin data into uh, micrograms per liter? That would be, uh, yeah, like what's released into the water column? Yeah. Yeah, I would love to be able to do that. That's something I want to be able to do, and we've talked to some folks about it, and we're trying to figure out how that might work, because I think that's part of the whole loading question, right? And um, there, are, there are some like passive sampling techniques that can uh, measure the dissolved fractions, fat bags, if you've heard of them. But I think that there's still work that needs to be done using them to quantify, and it might just be a matter of, of doing sort of absorption curve or something like that. Um, but anyway, that's something that I would really like. 